Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm uh, Dave Deptula, AFA's Dean of the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies, and welcome to our Nuclear Deterrence Forum series. We're really fortunate today to have Gordon Chang and Rick Fisher uh, join us. Gordon is an East Asia expert and the author most recently of the Go great US-China tech war and losing South Korea. He's previously lived and worked in China and Hong Kong for almost two decades as counsel to the American fir law firm, Paul Weiss, and earlier in Hong Kong as partner in the internal law firm, Baker and McKenzie. He's also the author of Nuclear Showdown, North Korea Takes on the World and the Coming Collapse of China. Rick Fisher is a senior fellow on Asian military affairs at the International Assessment and Strategy Center and is a recognized authority on the PRC military and the Asian military balance. Prior to his current position, Rick worked as Asian Studies Director at the Heritage Foundation and as a senior analyst for Chris Cox Policy Committee in support of the report of the Select Committee for the US National Security and Military Commercial Concerns with the People's Republic of China. Welcome, gentlemen, uh, and thank you both for taking the time to join us today. I'd like to start today's session by giving each of you an opportunity to make a few opening remarks on China's defense buildup, modernization of its nuclear forces, and the current status of US-China relations. So let's start with Rick and then you, Gordon. Over to you, Rick. Thank you, General. Uh, if we could call up uh, the first slide, please. The big question facing many analysts of uh, China's military and uh, strategic intentions is will China now be finally building up to strategic nuclear parity with the United States and Russia? On uh, May 8, Hu Jilin, the editor-in-chief of the Global Times, stated, quote, China needs to expand the number of its nuclear weapons to 1,000 in a relatively short time. It needs to have at least 100 Dongfeng-41 strategic missiles. Now, this is about as close to a press release as we're going to get from the Chinese Communist Party, which, as Ambassador uh, Marshall Billingsley uh, stated uh, two days ago, maintains a great wall of secrecy. China is simply not going to tell us when and how it's going to build up its nuclear warhead arsenal. Uh, but there are questions here. Uh, does Hu Jilin's uh, uh, very uh, direct statement mean that might China have these 1,000 warheads already? Why does China need that number? Is that what it needs to uh, win a war over Taiwan? And will China also require that level in order to meet its goals for global hegemony by 2050? It's also important to note that China's secrecy has kept many of us befuddled for a long time. Uh, back in 2000, the Council on Foreign Relations uh, rated a Chinese option of going for parity as amongst the least of uh, five unlikely nuclear future scenarios for the Chinese. Uh, next slide, please. Now, looking at the uh, current Chinese arsenal for ICBMs, in uh, 2019, which would have covered the year 2018. It's the latest report that we have from the Department of Defense. The annual uh, China military power report stated that China had about 90 intercontinental ballistic missiles. If you divide this by one unit of ICBM each per type of ICBM and assign, let's say, 18 missiles to those brigades, you roughly get about 90 uh, uh, ICBMs, uh, not counting 
two types of ICBMs that we know the Chinese are working on, a multiple warhead version of the DF-5 called the DF-5C and uh, a rail version of the 10 warhead capable DF-41. Now, uh, this number of, uh, of 90 roughly results in about 300 warheads. And this is sort of the assumed number that China has today. And uh, about a year ago, on May 31st, 2019, the director of the DIA, Lieutenant General Robert Ashley, uh, suggested China would double the size of its uh, nuclear warhead stockpile. Okay, next slide, please. Now, in August of 2019, there was a very curious posting on uh, a popular Chinese uh, military issue aggregating uh, webpage, uh, a post by a fairly consistent Chinese uh, observer commentator who uh, basically told us that uh, the size of an ICBM brigade was going to be expanding to 60 ICBMs. Now, we don't know if this is true. We're not going to get a press release, not even from the Global Times, about such numbers. But uh, the chart that I've, I've put together uh, it kind of gives an estimate for what the ICBM warhead count might result in uh, should the Chinese actually expand in this direction. And uh, just looking at, uh, again, one unit of uh, per uh, known ICBM, that number could exceed 1,000. <laughs> now, Hu Jilin, in opting for 100 DF-41s, is, is calling for 600 to 1,000 warheads based on whether you think the DF-41 can carry six warheads or 10. Okay, next slide, please. And then we have to consider submarine launch ballistic missiles. <coughs> Today, China has six type 094 SSBNs in service, each with 12 JL2 SLBMs, single warheads, so 72 warheads. <coughs> But we know that China is working very hard to expand its nuclear submarine production facilities in Huludao. Uh, there is a, an image on the lower left of this slide showing uh, some of the construction activity in Huludao with a very prominent dock in the middle. Now, the Department of Defense expects that the succeeding next generation submarine, the Type 096, will be coming along in the early to mid 2020s. How many more? We don't know. Great wall of secrecy. How many SLBMs will it carry? Again, we don't know. There are questions about the succeeding submarine launch ballistic missile, the JL 3. Uh, Last year, one Chinese source suggested it might have six warheads and a range of 12,000 kilometers, which would allow it to conduct its patrols well within the coverage of defensive uh, Chinese uh, aircraft, ships, and submarines, conventional submarines. But if we posit, take this Chinese number of, of six warheads, add them up and then add them to the, uh, you know, the, add the 72, we come up with a possible estimate of over 500 warheads just on submarines. Now, uh, the, the last slide, please. The People's Liberation Army is going to have a strategic triad, probably by the mid 2020s. In 2014, an Asian government source, source uh, revealed to me that the H-20, Xi'an's <clears throat> stealthy bomber, would be in service by 2025. 
there have been reports, uh, rumors, that a prototype might make some kind of appearance at the Zhuhai Air Show this November. But that's not usually the Chinese way of revealing major weapon systems like this. They like to uh, engage in a, in a very protracted revelation rather than reveal it all at once. Now, in support of the bomber force, we're beginning to see <clears throat> strategic capable tankers. The, a tanker version of the new Y-20 transport was uh, pictured flying over China on May 12, on the lower left of the slide. That tanker is more than capable of refueling the new H-6N bomber with very prominent refueling probe, making uh, at least theoretically possible bomber strikes against Hawaii. And uh, there are over 100 of the upgraded H-6K bombers in service. These could be modified with refueling probes, but uh, they exist today to carry uh, six uh, uh, cruise missiles each, which in total constitute the bulk of uh, the PLA's theater uh, missiles now deployed. And I think I'll stop there, uh, General. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Rick. Over to you, Gordon. Well, thank you, General, and thanks to the Institute and to Rick. We underestimate China. No, we don't underestimate its strength. In fact, we overestimate it, especially these days of a contracting Chinese economy and when the rest of the country is in a mess. We underestimate China's boldness, its brazenness, its hostility. We underestimate its ability to lash out. And because we underestimate all of this, we can be taken by surprise. Today, I'm gonna to talk about China's nuclear doctrine. And so as to not leave you in suspense, I'm going to make the case that we should assume the worst. So let's get started. China has a no first use policy. It was first announced in 1964, just after detonating its first atomic device. And obviously the regime wanted to reassure the world. It wanted to achieve deterrence. Well, today, as we've just heard from Rick, China clearly has deterrence, but they also still have a need for a no first use policy. So for instance, no first use, as we learned during the Cold War, is the policy of an aggressor. And China certainly is an aggressor. And as we learned during the Cold War, and as we can see today in the India-Pakistan confrontation, no first use is a policy for a country that possesses a significant advantage in conventional forces. Or to turn it around, um, countries that have a significant disadvantage in conventional forces just don't have no first use policies. Well, China, with the possible exception of Japan, has a conventional um, superiority with all of its neighbors. And indeed, in its peripheral waters, China has a superiority in conventional forces against the United States. So it's no surprise that today, China still has a no first use policy. Moreover, let's take a look at what Chinese military officers and what Chinese analysts say about their no first use policy. They basically say that nuclear escalation is hard to control. And from that, that gives rise to the belief that Chinese officers would really be hesitant about using their nukes first. Nonetheless, we have cause for great concern. We have cause for great concern because we have heard comments from Chinese general officers and from Chinese officials that indicate that China does indeed have a doctrine of using its nukes first. Because there have been a series of statements about incinerating American cities in circumstances where it's clear that the US would not first use its nuclear weapons. So for instance, in October, 1995, the Chinese general said this to one of our ambassadors, quote, in the end, you care more about Los Angeles than about Taipei. That general statement was repeated 10 years later by General Zhu Chonghu, who then basically said, look, we reserve the right to use nukes against Taiwan. 
And that statement is also repeated by China's civilian officials. So for instance, the infamous Xia Zhu Khan, um, about 10 years earlier, talked about how um, China would use nukes to take back Taiwan. And by the way, this is the only time in history, is China's the only country that has ever threatened to nuke territory that it considers to be its own. The second point here though, uh, is that essentially the Chinese doctrine is basically to do anything it possibly can do. And here we have Chao Liang, who wrote this book, Unrestricted Warfare. He said, unrestricted warfare means we can do anything we want. There are no rules. And when you look at his book, it's not official policy. But nonetheless, it is thought to be reflective of thinking in the senior ranks of the People's Liberation Army. In unrestricted warfare, what they do is they demote the concept of atomic warfare, as they call it, from its special status. This book basically lists 24 types of warfare, which they call methods of operation. And the doctrine in unrestricted warfare, the book, is that these 24 types of warfare can be mixed and matched to create new types of warfare. So this is an indication, a hint, that China doesn't really have a no first use policy. In any event, of course, um, when the situation is considered to be dire, any country will throw out its doctrine. Now for nations wondering about what China might do with its nuclear weapons, it's important to look at the debate that is occurring this day, these days in, in Chinese circles. So for instance, we understand that this debate is going on, which means that the, the policy of no first use is at least being challenged. There are Chinese analysts who say that the country should use nuclear weapons first if its nuclear command and control facilities are targeted by conventional weapons. And that to a certain extent makes sense. That would, inherent, that would enhance deterrence. But a lot of other things that they say don't make sense. So for instance, there are analysts in China who say, look, we should use go, uh, go nuke if, for instance, our facilities, our cities are attacked with conventional forces that have the power of nuclear weapons. And there's, again, this notion that uh, China reserves the right to use nukes against Taiwan. And there are even some Chinese analysts who say that if regime change is imminent, China should use nukes. Now, the notion of using nuclear weapons in a civil war is just totally, totally insane. So far, we've been trying to figure out China's intentions, but what we should really do is remember that intentions don't really count. If we go back to the end of the Cold War, we Americans learn that uh, despite all that we had assumed during that long struggle, that Soviet nuclear planners were interested in um, preventing escalation, um, and, and therefore they were interested in escalation control. Well, we learned that that was not right. So for us to now base our doctrine on what we assume Chinese doctrine to be would be similarly dangerous. So instead of looking at intentions, let's take a quick look at capabilities. Rick has talked about warheads, ICBMs, and the rest. We also know that China has 150 or at least 150 tactical nukes, probably more. And the question is, and we think about this, do they have tactical nukes because they want to counter an attack with tactical nukes? Or do they have tactical nukes because they want to escalate or de-escalate? But for us, I think it's more important that we know that they have these, these weapons and they probably plan to use them. As as Rick has shown, China intends to modernize its nuclear arsenal. It also intends to increase it. But China already has a de credible deterrent. So the question is, are these plans to increase its arsenal consistent with this notion of no first use? Let's step back for a moment. Since about the middle of February, we have seen Xi Jinping, the Chinese ruler, go on a binge what some people call manifestations of wolf warrior diplomacy. So for instance, China has made numerous threats to invade Taiwan. 
There have been boat bumping and other incidents in the East China Sea and South China Sea against six of its neighbors, Japan, Taiwan, the Philippines, Vietnam, Indonesia, Malaysia. There have been um, these uh, uh, absurd statements that Kazakhstan should be part of China. Um, China's moved quickly to end autonomy in Hong Kong. Chinese troops at this moment are deep into Indian territory. Um, this has been in a number of different spots. This incursion started in the beginning of last month. And this is not just about China's neighbors, it's also about us. Because in recent months, we have seen an increase in tempo of dangerous intercepts of the US Navy in the global commons. China is lashing out. It's sort of like this Maoist policy of attacking everybody at once. And this is an indication whether China is strong or weak, that China is dangerous. One final point. I don't think that COVID-19 started out as an intentional release of the pathogen, but I think that Xi Jinping, after having seen what the coronavirus did to cripple China, I think that he did want to get even. I think that he wanted to level the playing field by spreading the disease beyond China's borders. And in fact, he took steps which inevitably led to the spread of disease. So this was deliberate. This is the first time in history that one nation has attacked all the others. And a person who can attack the world with a pathogen is certainly capable of using nuclear weapons first in a conflict. So we have to assume that Xi Jinping, the Chinese leader, is capable of anything, that he's capable of everything. Thanks very much. Uh, well, thanks, Gordon and Rick, for that uh, fantastic uh, overview. Uh, and uh, Gordon, wow, that was a very uh, powerful uh, insight uh, and uh, provided a perspective that uh, few are hearing uh, in the greater uh, international uh, uh, discussion space. So I hope that um, it will uh, get out here and uh, folks will take what you said to heart, uh, particularly um, uh, on uh, both sides of the political spectrum here in the United States uh, and uh, focus on uh, what we need to do to be able to counter some of the challenges that we see coming from China. Um, so let's, let's jump into this a little bit more. Um, uh, let me toss to you both a question on uh, counter force versus counter value. Um, historically, China is limited in relatively rudimentary nuclear force structure meant that the standard of sufficiency was the ability to survive an enemy first strike and then launch a counterattack, uh, primarily against counter value targets such as cities um, that really don't require a high degree of uh, targeting precision. However, as China modernizes and expands its forces, as you both described, uh, it's increasingly capable of delivering accurate theater level strikes against more heavily defended targets. Uh, does this portend a shift in China's nuclear policy toward a limited war fighting strategy that offers a wider range of offensive and escalatory nuclear options to Chinese commanders specifically to prioritize counterforce targets? General, I, I believe so. Uh, already, there are ICBM bases uh, in the north of China with uh, DF-31 ICBMs that are very well placed to launch uh, preemptive strikes against our Minuteman fields in uh, the northern uh, continental United States. Uh, in addition, the Chinese have developed a very varied range of uh, intermediate range nuclear missiles, medium range, uh, and uh, they are targeting not just the United States, but they're also targeting Russia uh, and India. And uh, should our allies in Asia uh, be forced to acquire nuclear weapons, I think the Chinese expecting this uh, will increase the size of their theater nuclear missile arsenal to be able to overwhelm uh, those countries with, with their new nuclear deterrent. Uh, but uh, for sure, with uh, over 2,000 theater range uh, uh, missile systems, uh, many of them dual capable, 
of able of carrying a, a nuclear warhead, uh, the Chinese very clearly have a counterforce capability that is uh, aimed at the United States uh, military uh, network in uh, Asia. You know, all that I could, all I could add to that is that um, in the last three or four days, China has said it will not join discussions with Moscow and Washington about extending arms control. And essentially what Beijing is saying to the world is, look, we want to have exactly the same capabilities that the United States and Russia have. So whatever we can do, they want to be able to do as well. Um, so nothing is really off the table with regard to Beijing. And the most important indication of that is that they've just told us that. So we know where this is going. And there's, there's something to add there, Gordon. Uh, the Russians are telling us that they are not going to put any pressure on the Chinese to join trilateral nuclear negotiations. This is very important because over the last decade, the Russians and the Chinese, in my opinion, have built a strategic level of cooperation. They've held openly announced exercises uh, toward missile defense, command posts, table talk exercises, if you will, but that suggests that Russia and China may also be engaging in offensive nuclear cooperation. And uh, for the Russians, it really doesn't matter if the Chinese are involved in nuclear negotiations because the Russians know that the Chinese are with them. And uh, this adds to the danger and the urgency of getting all three into negotiations. Yeah, and you know, if, if China is not a part of those negotiations, we shouldn't be either. Um, because as Rick points out, really, this is a two versus one fight. So we shouldn't be talking about arms control with Russia if China's not in the room. Um, for both of you, I, I don't know if you notice it, and uh, I meant to bring, uh, bring the source into here, but I, I read uh, late last night or early this morning, uh, an announcement by uh, and a senior official in China that they have absolutely no intention of participating in the t any such talks. Well, General, that's been a consistent Chinese attitude for decades and successive administrations, not just uh, the Trump administration, but the Obama, the Bush administration, even Clinton administration, uh, Bush administration before then. There have, all, there have always been outreaches to the Chinese to try and begin some kind of strategic issues dialogue. And the Chinese have always shut this down. Yeah, um, I, I guess just like you say, it, it, it's not unexpected based on past performance, but uh, I know that there are some out there that were hoping that uh, in uh, today's world, um, there, there may have been some change, but it doesn't appear that that will be the case. Um, let me shift the discussion to uh, another area of uh, uh, big concern uh, particularly to U.S. Uh, commanders who plan contingencies, and that's the issue of underground tunnel construction. Um, China has built thousands of miles of underground uh, tunnels equipped with uh, rail lines and trucks to store and transport its mobile ICBMs. Um, what's the continuing significance of this construction, and do you view it primarily as a means to ensure its second strike capability, um, to covertly build up its arsenal of deployed nuclear weapons uh, or something else? Well, General, the, the tunnel construction, uh, which extends back to the 60s, uh, also pertains to uh, major air bases and uh, to uh, the basing of submarines as well. And now with uh, the PLA investing in rail mobile ICBMs, all of the tunnels that have been constructed for railways through mountains uh, can also be added to the thousands of kilometers that have been uh, built specifically to hide uh, ICBMs and, and other mobile missiles. But uh, for sure, this is uh, a, a way for the PLA to uh, survive weather uh, any kind of first strike against their force. Uh, but it also conceals all preparations that the Chinese may be making for their own first strike as well. 
The only thing I can say is this is scary. Yeah. Uh, well, I would, um, uh, those of us who obviously have been following China for many years um, have read the book, uh, Unrestricted Warfare, and I encourage anybody in the audience who hasn't read it to read it. Um, all you have to do is Google Unrestricted Warfare online and you can pull up the book for free and it's a two hour read. Uh, but it gives a lot of insight in, into exactly um, what Gordon talked about. I mean, there are no rules as far as it comes uh, to uh, orchestrating their uh, national security uh, aspirations or uh, <laughs> a global uh, hegemonic aspirations, uh, perhaps more properly said. Um, so let's move on to the impact of COVID-19 on uh, PLA. Uh, fascinating what you said earlier, uh, Gordon, on uh, uh, Xi's intent exporting uh, to sort of level the global playing field. Uh, but Rick, we, we frequently discuss the potential impacts of uh, the COVID virus on the United States and the strains it's likely to place on the U.S. military. On the other hand, um, China, even as late as April, had the temerity to claim that no PLA personnel had been infected. Um, what impacts do you see COVID actually having on Chinese defense modernization uh, and industry, uh, if any, uh, particularly considering uh, the example that uh, Wuhan is a major hub of Chinese defense in the aerospace? Well, General, when the Chinese really want to clamp down, uh, they are capable of uh, amazing OPSEC. And uh, I would, uh, posit that the Wuhan coronavirus story in China as regards the PLA is one of these examples where they have managed to clamp down on all internet traffic and make sure that their own personnel on bases remain relatively isolated from the, the main population, but also are not able at, at all to comment uh, and on any kind of media about uh, the real impact. I mean, Wuhan itself is a center of um, critical research and development facilities for the PLA Navy uh, and uh, the space sector. Uh, uh, it is a uh, close to a, a uh, major uh, conventional submarine uh, manufacturing location. So uh, the, f the idea that the PLA was not affected is ludicrous. Uh, but the PLA also is going to strive to make sure that we don't know, that we don't have an idea to what extent they were affected. Yeah, I think um, um, all of this, when you look at the global statistics, feel that um, you know, there's, there's, there's a large lack of uh, transparency in uh, the, the numbers that have been released by many other countries um, around the world. If one is to gauge the United States public figures um, as a, a measure of merit. Um, Gordon, I, 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 you, I, I thought it was fascinating how you already introduced how she's uh, playing COVID-19, but um, uh, what if any sort of diplomatic backlash has uh, China faced due to these activities? And uh, what about the duplicity regarding the outbreak of COVID-19? Comments? Yeah, we're seeing around the world a, um, you know, you can call it a backlash. Certainly, it's a new wave of skepticism of Chinese intentions. So, for instance, yesterday, for the first time, the European Union um, talked about China's disinformation campaign. These were harsh words from Brussels, something that we haven't heard before. China's problem, ultimately, is that we are going to learn more and more about Chinese activities starting from, let's say, August of last year, all the way through January and February. And when we do that, China is going to be shown in a worse and worse light, and it is going to suffer reputational damage. And this damage, I think, will probably translate into policy changes. The most important thing here, if I could back up just a moment, is... I think that Xi Jinping is trying to divert the world's attention from what went on. We know that China admitted for the first time that COVID-19 was human to human transmissible on January 20. But doctors in Wuhan knew this no later than the second week of December. And from that Harvard study that was released this week, 
they may have known about this sometime in August or October. So if China had said nothing during those five weeks or those four months, depending where you start this, then that would have been grossly irresponsible. But we know that Beijing tried to convince the world that the novel coronavirus was not human to human transmissible. And that, of course, lulled countries around the world into not taking precautions that they otherwise would have. So this was deliberate, deliberate falsification. And at the same time, Xi Jinping is, was pressuring countries not to impose travel restrictions and quarantines on arrivals from China. And he, of course, enlisted the World Health Organization in both of these narratives that uh, the coronavirus was not H to H, human to human, and that countries shouldn't impose travel restrictions. Well, the lack of travel restrictions meant that this disease, which should have been mostly confined to the central part of China, Hubei province, Wuhan and in its environs, was actually became a global pandemic. So there's no other explanation that fits the facts. We are going, now this view of, uh, that I've had on this is not the majority view by any means. But as I said, we are going to learn more about what China has done and China is going to suffer that reputational background because we're going to learn that this was um, a deliberate act, that this was reckless, this was malicious, um, this was, and I hate to use the term, but clearly this was close to mass murder because they knew what was going to happen. I think that that puts China in a very different light. And one other thing, this coronavirus has crippled the Chinese economy. We know they, they've actually admitted to a contraction in the first quarter of this year. This quarter doesn't look very much better. They probably are not going to tell us honestly what happened in the economy, but we know that China can't actually produce the uh, money that the PLA needs to modernize, which means that I think Xi Jinping is going to get to the point where he sees the closing window of opportunity, the use it or lose it mentality. And as a number of people said, maybe we shouldn't worry about China in the 2030s and the 2040s. We should worry about China right now, because now is the time that they may see that they've got to do it. And when we've looked at what China has in fact done since the second week, third week, second week in February, we got to be really concerned because they are lashing out already. Well, that's very uh, disconcerting, uh, but it certainly is realistic in the context that you put it. Uh, and then you lay on top of that um, all the challenges that uh, are, are erupting uh, in the United States, um, both uh, with respect to um, the racial issues as well as uh, COVID itself. Uh, it doesn't take a big stretch of the imagination to figure that a, uh, an adversary actor uh, might be tempted to take advantage of those situations. So uh, what's the impact? I mean, I... I I don't know how many in the audience are aware of the fact, but you know, China is seeking to use its uh, military strength, uh, including its nuclear forces, uh, to advance its other interests, particularly its uh, dubious economic activities um, uh, that we're well aware of in terms of intellectual uh, property theft and course of trade practices and the broader uh, Belt and Road Initiative. Um, do, do you see this? The, the situation with the uh, COVID and uh, 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 lowering of, uh, un, of, of respect for uh, China and its actions, putting a crimp in uh, these uh, malicious activities on the part of Chinese, or do you think they'll continue? Well, if we look at the Belt and Road, Belt and Road never made sense from an economic point of view to start out with. And right now, China's got a problem in that it's got a lot of loans which were made on essentially uncommercial terms. Um, and some of these loans are coming due, especially the ones in Africa. There are a number of African nations that cannot repay. Uh, and this was even before the coronavirus. Now the coronavirus has um, hobbled a lot of African countries. They don't have the ability to repay China. China now faces a real problem in terms of their debt trap diplomacy, which they thought that they would debt trap the debtors, but what it's really doing, it's debt trapping the creditor, China. So I think that what we're seeing is, you know, people um, use the term imperial overstretch um, and, you know, Paul Kennedy from Yale. Um, that's clearly what's going on right now. You know, China had strategic goals. It had goals which were not supported by its economy or by economic um, factors. And, and right now, 
I, I think that essentially 2020, 2021 is the year when these things start to hit home on China and they're not able to maintain those ambitions. And when a um, overstretched empire can't um, realizes that it can't actually achieve what it wants, then it might actually do things which would, as I talked about before, take us by surprise. Um, China is also uh, relying on its investment in global governing elites, especially in Africa, to uh, moderate uh, the reactions in various countries to uh, the impact of the virus. Uh, and based on that investment, China, I think, concluded many years ago that it also had to invest in how to control future elites in uh, these countries of concern, which is why it is uh, pushing so hard to promote its uh, 5G digital uh, communication technology all around the world. With that technology uh, linked to Huawei or ZTE or other Chinese companies, uh, the Chinese intelligence services have the ability to monitor uh, attitudes towards China on a population basis and uh, can uh, apply pressures uh, to ensure that uh, critics of China uh, have difficult careers and uh, don't rise to become problems. You know, 5G is the Internet of Things. Internet of Things is that every device at home, work, your car, all connected to the Internet. If you control the world's 5G backbone, you do two things. First of all, you steal the world's data, and that makes your AI, your artificial intelligence systems, a lot better. But it also means that theoretically you can control those devices around the world. So, you know, we've been talking about warfare. Just imagine just a half hour before war starts, you know, all the traffic lights in the United States go blank, the grids go down, all of these things um, could occur if China were to control 5G. Now, fortunately, we have seen Huawei take a few big hits in the last month because the Trump administration is now appears to be absolutely determined, or at least 95% determined to put Huawei down. So this is a really good development that we're seeing that the United States is actually taking the fight to China now, instead of us being the object of attack after attack after attack. Okay, well, Gordon and Rick, um, really thank you both for uh, your comments uh, today uh, and for taking the time to share your insights. Um, they really have been insightful. Uh, so on behalf of the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies uh, and all of AFA, we wish you the very, very best in this era of ever increasing uh, challenges. Now, as a reminder to our listeners, uh, to get an automatic copy of this event, please go to the YouTube website and subscribe to the Mitchell Institute channel. Our next event in our Mitchell Institute Nuclear Deterrent Series will be with Dr. Uzi Rubin on uh, Tuesday, July 14th. Dr. Rubin was a founder and first director of the Israeli Missile Defense Organization uh, and it should prove to be a interesting discussion as well. Okay, folks, um, uh, Gordon and Rick, we're now gonna open this session to questions from the audience who've been listening to the conversation. Um, for those of you uh, in the audience, I would ask that um, if you've got a question, please use the raise hand function uh, on your uh, uh, computer uh, and uh, then announce uh, your name uh, and then the organization that you are uh, uh, from. So let's start. We've got our uh, first question, a gentleman from uh, Sangman Lee. Go ahead. Uh, you need to unmute. There you go. Okay. Um, this is, I'm, I'm a Sangmin Lee. I'm a reporter from the Radio Free Asia. Can you hear me? Yep. We can yep. hear you. Okay. So yesterday, um, it is reportedly that uh, North Korea um, has been, uh, I mean, the, there is indication that North Korea preparing another provocation, like uh, uh, preparing the launch ICBM and then moving the TEL. So uh, do you have any uh, indication that North Korea doing another provocation? And then, so uh, what do you expect about that? Well, North Korea right now is um, it involved in a number of fights. Um, so for instance, um, yesterday it also said it was cutting off communications with South Korea. 
which is really an attempt to intimidate Moon Jae-in, the South Korean president, into giving Kim Jong-un, the North Korean dictator, all that he wants. And so I wouldn't be surprised that this is Kim's um, spring offensive um, because, you know, they normally do launch missiles this time of year. Um, if they were to launch an ICBM, um, it would be considered a provocation by the United States. But they, they have told us exactly what they're going to do. You know, we call the North Koreans um, non-transparent, but they actually said in September 2017, they said they were going to launch an ICBM and they were going to detonate a nuclear device over the Pacific. And indeed, every country that has an arsenal today has had an atmospheric test. And that's the one thing that North Korea needs to do is to have an atmospheric test um, because they need to prove that they can, uh, that they've got a deterrent. So we should be expecting this. I don't know if it's going to be in the next week or next year, but they will do this. And by the way, when we're talking about North Korea, just one point, you know, Rick talked about how China and Russia coordinate themselves. So we sort of view ourselves as this is the U.S. versus those two big super states. But it's also North Korea and Iran um, implementing Chinese policies because Beijing has one way or another proliferated nuclear weapons and missile technology to these countries, um, Russia to a much lesser extent. So really what we're facing is just not a North Korea issue. We're facing a China issue um, when North Korea does something belligerent or provocative. Every Chinese or every North Korean ICBM is moved by a vehicle made in China. Uh, Hwasong 14, Hwasong 15, Hwasong 13. The transporter erector launchers that are used by the North Korean regime to move its ICBMs are designed and most likely made in China and transferred to North Korea. North Korea is basically a proxy for China. North Korea is able to create crises that will divert the United States' attention. And then China, with all of those theater nuclear weapons, and soon intercontinental nuclear weapons, will be able to deter the United States from defending its interests, such as to defend Taiwan from invasion, defend Japan from attack, or even ultimately defend South Korea from a North Korean invasion. Okay, thanks very much, gentlemen. How about Lou Steinhoff? Yes, can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay, um, I believe, uh, Gordon, I believe I've heard you before down at the uh, Air War College. Maybe you uh, took a visit down there. I just finished a two-year detail down there as the uh, NNSA faculty chair. So I'm back in the uh, Washington area now. But um, one of the things I wanted to ask uh, really all of you, uh, probably uh, we'll start with you, uh, Gordon. Um, you know, Knopf talked about the uh, fourth wave of uh, nuclear deterrence policy. And there's a lot of people that believe there's a fifth wave now that, that, that includes space and cybersecurity. Um, what are your thoughts on, on China and their, their move or lack thereof into space and, and or cybersecurity as it relates to their uh, nuclear deterrence policy? Well, Rick really is, is the expert on, on all of these things. But uh, you know, clearly what we have seen is China take the lead in, in cyber attacking the United States. Um, and so when you know, you, we step back and look at this, um, we can expect uh, the U.S. to be viciously cyber attacked uh, before China launches. And as Rick points out, um, China could very well um, plan a first strike. You know, there was a ch retired Chinese general in August 2011 who blurted out to the South China Morning Post that uh, China was actually considering a surprise attack on the U.S. Those words, quote, surprise attack on the U.S., and he was referring to a missile launch. Um, so this is, wow. you know, whenever we think about all of these issues, for the Chinese, they're all combined together and they provide uh, Beijing with a powerful weapon. So as I said, th this could be 
you know, this could be much worse than anything that we've experienced before, largely because China just is malicious. Um, it, it does really believe that it should rule the world. Xi Jinping actually has been dropping hints that China's the world's only sovereign state, which means that all the rest of us are subjects. So there's the mentality there to do anything possible, um, as they say, unrestricted warfare. Uh, Lee, I, I follow space developments far more closely than the, the cyber world, but uh, I conclude that China long ago decided that control of the Earth-Moon system was a necessity to be able to advance its ambitions on Earth. Control of low Earth orbit is essential for victory uh, on, on, the, on the surface of the planet. And uh, this is being borne out by the moves that China is taking, in my opinion. Uh, we may be seeing a move to put people on the moon by the middle of this decade. Uh, the Chinese have revealed certain programs that uh, certainly add up to that potential. And the interest uh, in deep space is also, in my opinion, very telling. The mission to the far side of the moon was uh, uh, largely concocted to enable the Chinese to develop a presence at the L1 Lagrangian point. L1 uh, is, is going to be the, the place of a lot more Chinese activity in the not too distant future. We plan to put up one uh, space telescope at uh, the L1 location, the, the Webb telescope that we've been working on for a long time. The Chinese may assemble a constellation of uh, radar telescopes and L1 by 2030, at least according to some of the sources uh, I've been able to uncover. And just uh, recently, uh, the Chinese Academy of Sciences has a program to uh, intercept asteroids. So what we're, you know, this is, this is, this could be benign, sure. We, we'd uh, like it if the Chinese uh, could save us from an asteroid strike, but with them in control of that power, we also have to ask, Will they indeed do that? If they can calculate that an asteroid is, is going to impact on a major enemy, are they going to stop it? That's, that's the kind of uh, uh, power that they will have. And the history of a communist party that has already killed 70 million of its own people uh, can't really be expected to have as much regard for anybody else. Um. Uh, thank you both for that. I was going to, your, your, both your answers kind of uh, stimulated a, a, a follow-up question. Um, given the, the method that the Chinese tend to follow in accomplishing their strategic goals and objectives, uh, the whole Sun Tzu-Zian based approach to warfare, given what they wrote about unrestricted warfare, wouldn't something like, isn't something like a direct missile attack on the United States um, 180 degrees out from their established processes and uh, methods for uh, the potential conduct of warfare? You would think so. Um, and I don't really expect them to do that. But remember, um, China is malign, as we all know. Um, if they think that we're not going to respond for some reason, then I think that they might actually consider that. Um, you know, they have, we, we sort of assume that they think like we do on these issues. We know that they yeah. don't. We don't know exactly how, what their doctrine is, as, as so I sort of ran through. We can, we can tell you what they say, but we don't really know what they say behind closed doors. And if they think that they could take out a couple of US cities um, and not suffer retaliation, them very well that they may be able to do that. There's one factor we haven't talked about, and that is the desperation of Chinese leaders. Remember Xi Jinping, um, when he became General Secretary of the Communist Party in November 2012, he took a consensus-driven system and made it a one-man system. Now, in a consensus-driven system, no one gets praise, no one gets blamed for mistakes. In a one-person system, though, a couple things occur. With great power, as we know from Spider-Man, comes great responsibility and great accountability. He's got nobody else to blame. But more important than that, 
he took a communist party that had sort of been uh, made benign. In, in the Maoist era, if you lost a political struggle, you often lost your life. Deng Xiaoping, his successor, sort of gave everybody a dacha if they failed. And so he reduced the cost of losing, which meant that people didn't have the incentive to tear the Communist Party apart. What Xi Jinping has done is he's raised the cost of losing political struggles. So Xi Jinping knows himself that if he were to lose a political struggle, it's not like he's going to get a villa outside of Beijing. He's going to lose not only his position, he could lose his freedom, he could lose his assets, and by the way, this also includes his family, and he could lose his life. So if you think you're going to be killed, and if you think you can get away without taking a couple American cities with you, maybe you might do that. I'm not saying that he would. I'm saying he has the incentives to do that, especially if he thinks there is, uh, if, if, if deterrence fails. And for a lot of reasons that Rick can talk about, deterrence seems to not be as strong as it was in the past, especially if we de-alert, especially if we do all sorts of things that people talk about. Xi Jinping may think he can get away with it. Uh, yeah, Gordon, I understand those points. I and mean, we could go on with this discussion for another hour or so, because I dare say uh, that there is no American president that would uh, stand by and absorb the loss of a couple of American cities without responding with complete devastation uh, to the offending party. But be that as it may, let us uh, move on. We've got uh, time for one more question. Mr. Doug Berkey, please. Hey, gentlemen, I'm Doug of Mitchell Institute. I'm curious, U.S. allies are investing a significant amount in new military systems to deter China. How would you look at these actions in terms of China's interpretation of them and their relative value in deterring Chinese aggression in the region? I think the Japanese submarines, the Soryu class, um, are something that China can't deal with. Um, so I'm sure that uh, China thinks twice uh, before taking on Japan. But the big issue here is what's happening in the region. Um, you have India, Vietnam, Japan, uh, Australia, the United States working much more closely. So I think China sees that it is creating, a, or it should see, it's creating a coalition against it. And, and that is, uh, I think, something that does deter China to some extent. Um, because these militaries are working more closely. They are developing interoperability. Um, they're doing all sorts of things that make um, their, um, their militaries um, much more impressive. So I think China has a real problem here. Um, and this is going to be, a, this is one of the really good developments. Next year is the 80th anniversary of the Atlantic Charter. The people in Asia are now talking about an Indo-Pacific Charter which would basically be an Asian NATO. Um, and that's another good story as we see these countries work more closely together. But the most important investments that some of our allies are making are in their own missile systems. We've had a long dialogue with our South Korean allies over this, and uh, we've come to an agreement that yes, indeed, uh, we, they can, they can uh, build these missiles uh, and that they can have significant range. Japan is now investing in the development of new hypersonic missiles uh, uh, to assist in uh, naval warfare. Uh, the United States, of course, as, as many of us, uh, many of you in the audience understand, is finally stepping up to the challenge of deterring China's uh, 2200 uh, theater nuclear uh, and uh, dual use uh, systems. And uh, when we are able to uh, deploy uh, new uh, medium and intermediate range uh, systems, uh, we should be considering, we should be considering already uh, offering uh, appropriate systems to, to some of our allies. Uh, we've always re relied strategically on Taiwan's ability to be the first line of deterrence against a Chinese attack. I think that capability today now requires a large number of ballistic uh, missiles and also ballistic anti-ship ballistic missiles. Uh, and uh, we previously, we did not want to sell Taiwan, anything that could be considered an offensive uh, weapon. Uh, and uh, we hoped 
that the Chinese would moderate their buildup against Taiwan. Well, all those calculations are, are, are have proved false. All we've done is uh, given the Chinese time to build the technical capabilities and then the production capabilities to assemble the forces that they need to invade uh, a democracy. And so we should not be holding back either. We should be selling our allies what they need to deter China. Great comments from uh, both of you. Uh, and it's a wonderful way to uh, end up this uh, nuclear deterrence forum. Um, once again, I'd like to thank you both. Uh, your, your insights have been uh, absolutely incredible today. Uh, and to you and our audience, uh, thanks very much. Uh, and have a great aerospace power kind of day. Take care. Thank you, Thank you very much.